Good morning, guys. It is Thursday, September 26, 2024. This bathrobe business. I got the coffee and I got the news. Uh, I've been off for a few days just simply because uh, in reading on the stories, I didn't really find anything compelling enough to make a full video about. Uh, so it's my first video, I think, since Monday. Uh, maybe since last third Friday. Yeah, I believe since last Friday. But anyway, let's jump into it. Uh, I've got a number of stories for you, all centered, I think, around interest rates in the economy. Uh, I'm going to start with this number because I think it's terrifying. Uh, this is what I talk about often is the price of gold. Um, so again, I know this uh, is a subject nobody seems to care about, but it actually plays a major role. So the cost of gold is actually reaching an only record again, despite the fact that it hit a all-time record pretty much week after week for the last year. Uh, so gold is now above 2600 and is nearing 27. It hit about 2691, so it's probably going to hit 2700 today. Uh, let me see if it already has just in the time that I've started. Yep, it's at 2702. So that is insane. Uh, as I've mentioned before, 20 when adjusted for inflation, 2600 was the all time historical high. Uh, so 2700 means we're in uncharted territory. Gold has never been this high, neither nominally nor uh, adjusted for inflation. So that's kind of scary. Um, I don't actually know where the final number is going to land, but if it's going up this quickly before there is a crisis, if there is a crisis, it is going to skyrocket. Uh, I don't think it's unreasonable for it to be at 3000 by the end of uh, the year. What's terrifying about uh, this article, what I find terrifying about this article, uh, it was actually the previous article I had up, is obviously this is in response to interest rates. But uh, the interesting part of it is the article mentioned the fact that the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell is gonna be speaking today uh, and new numbers on labor are gonna be coming out on Friday. So everybody in the article is advocating for more interest rate cuts, despite the fact that we just got one. We just got one, what, a week ago, two weeks ago. And already they're asking for another half basis point, uh, two basis points, so 0.5%. Uh, uh, cut additionally to what we just got, uh, which would only drive these rates further. Now, in response to that story, there's a great story here from Axios. So let me share that screen with you guys. So Axios is talking about, is it sharing? One second. Okay, now that should be sharing. Okay, so this Axios story is talking about that uh, despite the cut, uh, interest rates have not actually dropped all that much. So um, let me actually take a tangent. Refis have increased a little bit. Um, so refis have actually increased by about 20% for the week uh, since the cut. But as far as actual interest uh, mortgage rates have not decreased that long. And this article does a great job of explaining exactly why. Because Unlike what we think, how would these interest rate cuts work? Uh, it's the interest rates are set by the Fed affect overnight borrowing more than anything else. They affect bond rates. They affect major corporations, and then it trickles down to everybody else. So this article talks about it, and it does a great job doing it because it says that most mortgages, uh, most bank loans, most financing that we get is set off of a ten-year uh, Treasury note. And that has been at about 3.71%. No, that has been at about 3.65% the entire time. Uh, plus or minus, up and down, it's been fluctuations. But the 10-year uh, uh, treasury yield has been below the funds rate for pretty much since day one. So this cut actually hasn't affected most of the population in the United States. Uh, because, in fact, our the treasury 10-year uh, treasury note actually went up in interest to 3.71 percent, what where it was at 3.65 percent before the cut. So technically, the mortgage rates actually increased slightly. Now, uh, why this happens is rather complicated, uh, but I think the important drawback, and again, links to all these articles are in the description below. I think the important uh, draw from this is the fact that when these interest rates get cut, they are not for Main Street; they are for Wall Street because overnight lending are for major banks, hedge funds. Uh, investment firms, a lot of them take advantage of overnight borrowing through the Fed. And because of that, they're the ones reaping the advantage of these interest rate cuts, not us. Now, the theory is, of course, trickle down economics, but uh, I'm not someone that believes in that. And uh, as I've illustrated on this channel, it never really seems to be true because every time interest rates go up, 
Main Street starts doing better. Every time interest rates go down, Wall Street starts doing better. And it makes perfect sense because most Main Street consumers do not take advantage of commercial and overnight lending on a daily basis, whereas these corporations do, and they use it to expand their power and their wealth. Uh, next story I'm going to talk about is also in regards to interest rates and the Federal Reserve, and that is in regards to uh, Fed Governor Bowman, as she explained that she is still worried about inflation. So she was the dissenting voice on the cut uh, that came a couple weeks ago. Uh, and she th- said that it was unwarranted because she's saying that interest rates are still too, uh, I'm sorry, inflation rates are still too high. Uh, the Fed still has not met the goal of 2%. And the federal in, uh, metric for uh, interest r- inflation right now is at 2.5. Now, as we've shown on this channel, I think a fair estimate is at least 3%. Uh, because of multiple things that have happened in the economy, uh, the housing market, uh, pr- uh, general prices of goods. I, I would say the inflation uh, rate is actually closer to at least three, and that's being pretty generous. If we go off of that gold number, it's much higher. But I would say 3% is at least somewhat arguably fair. I would not say it's at 25 uh, last story I'm going to talk about is one I foreshadowed a number of months ago. I think this was at the beginning of September, and uh, I forecasted that this was probably going to become a problem closer to the election. Uh, dock workers. So if uh, those that watch my channel regularly know that I talked about this issue back, I think, at the beginning of September, when both uh, this was looming and the railroad strike was looming in uh, Canada. So uh, the railroad strike in Canada was squashed essentially after a week. Uh, I, I don't think it even lasted a full week. Uh, the workers went on strike. Uh, Trudeau, got, Trudeau got involved, and it was completely shut down, I think, within 17 or 18 hours. Uh, this is our version of it. Uh, this is much more complicated. So in Canada, obviously, so much is moved by tra- uh, rail. Here in the United States, docks are how we get most of our imports and exports. And this dock worker strike is massive. Uh, as I've talked about, about about it before, this dock worker strike affects 14 ports from Maine all the way down to Houston. So we're talking the East Coast, uh, the Gulf Coast. And the uh, I think it's something some crazy number of uh, about 30,000 workers that are poised to go on strike on October 1st uh, because uh, the labor unions and uh, management have not met for a meeting since the beginning of September. So there's been literally no movement on negotiations since then. Uh, This is due to take effect on October 1st, so next Tuesday, unless the Biden administration steps in. Now, I think the Biden administration will step in and do something and squash this. Remember, they did that with railroad workers just a couple of years ago. But this is much more massive. uh, So there's no way they're not going to take action on it. Uh, This, uh, to talk about how big of a of an impact to the economy it is. If you wanna talk inflation, nothing would cause inflation faster than this. So the United States can't afford to do it. Now I'm actually on the side of the dock workers, but I'm just saying from the perspective of the economy, the Fed just cut interest rates, and here we are looking at massive inflation. Uh, a day strike would cost the economy $5 billion. And then there's also the fact of there's backup in the system. So in the articles I presented to you guys uh, when this first was presented back in uh, September, beginning of September, I think late August, it talked about how every single day uh, in a backlog, so a day of no movement, ends up uh, equating to about uh, four or five days of backlog. So essentially, in about if this lasts just a couple of days, we're looking at almost a two-week backlog as ships are just standing in the ports, not able to get unloaded. So it would take weeks and months, even just uh, with uh, uh, just a couple of days of striking, that would affect the economy for months to come. So something that happens in October would affect stuff that would happen well into January and February. I don't think uh, that is going to happen. I think there's too much pressure right now on the economy, especially in an election season. So I think this is going to be squashed fairly quickly. But if it doesn't, for some reason, if there's a turn of events we don't expect, expect massive inflation from this. Uh, This is something that's been on the horizon for at least a few months, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. That's pretty much it. Uh, Those are the stories of the day. Uh, I hope you guys have a productive Thursday. I should be back here tomorrow, uh, and uh, I'll see you then.